Well, good morning and welcome to today's FS Club webinar. Uh, and it's got a wonderful title, Lunatics and Unstable Coins, Forging Effective Regulatory Swords and Shields. And we're here today with Ian Sheridan, who is an Associate Director at Grand Thornton. Now you've read Ian's biography, but I don't think we could find anybody more qualified to be an honest and heartfelt critic of one of the great uh, things of the last 10 years. And like it or loathe it, uh, hype and gambling or the future of finance, we are here to talk about uh, coins. And, and it's in a particularly interesting week. Today's FS Club daily newsletter went out and said, a million people are now left uh, short by the FTX exchange, which collapsed in uh, quite a, a lovely little soap opera as a toss up between uh, two big beasts in the crypto world uh, just the other week. Uh, so we're here to chat about it. Now, you'll know me, I'm Michael Minelli. I'm one of the directors of Zien, but I'm only able to provide uh, webinars like this with uh, the rest of our team, thanks to the generosity and tolerance of our sponsors who let us range widely, uh, freely, uh, across technology, economics, and finance. And today we're certainly touching on technology, economics, and finance when we address the crypto world. Uh, but to many of our sponsors, may I say, we are doing so quite often holding our nose as we get tiptoe through this area. And my personal views, as many of you will know, have been a little bit uh, negative about the crypto space. Uh, uh, I have famous for my blockchain is boring video, uh, from something like eight or nine years ago. It's a useful technology, but it's been around for ages. It's been unfairly associated with crypto and that CBDCs or central bank digital currencies have nothing to do with crypto. And we, Zien, in conjunction with Ian Dowson, uh, published uh, an article on what we felt was happening in this space when we looked at initial coin offerings back in 2018. And we found that 60% of the projects there were certainly fraudulent because the coin wasn't trading 60 days later. Boston College, uh, also at the same time in 2018, did a study that said 60% of the coin's Twitter accounts uh, were not longer functioning, uh, no longer functioning 60 days later. So one could conclude that at least 60% of the sector was fraudulent, and that doesn't mean the other 40% was good. But is there something good in this space? And in the course of this, we began looking, as you know, at stable coins uh, as a group. And that's what Ian is here to address particularly. So uh, the agenda, as you'll know, is a fairly straightforward one. My job's to get out of the way. So I'm gonna make three very quick points. Yes, the slides are up there, as everybody seems to ask. Uh, secondly, uh, yes, this recording uh, will be available approximately two working days, so probably late Friday, or early Saturday. Good weekend watching with the family, I hope. Uh, now that the Lord Mayor show is over and you're sitting at home in the rain. And uh, finally, uh, yes, all the questions that you send in will be sent to Ian with your email attached so he can get back to you. If you just want to contact him, say, Ian, contact me. Uh, but please do feed the questions into the GoToWebinar facility. I'm not looking at my emails. I'm not on Zoom. I'm not on Single, but I will take your questions and feed them into the conversation. So with that opening, may I say, Ian, the floor is definitely yours. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay, Michael? Yes, it's super. Um, very briefly, three um, points of housekeeping. Uh, firstly, a big thank you to Michael and FS Club for inviting me. Secondly, anything I say is my own view, and they're not the views of Grant Thornton, UK LLP, or any of its affiliates. And, and thirdly, that if I'm saying anything slightly critical or, or waspish, I would say in obviously the context of there is a lot of um, unfolding of positions in in the crypto asset subsector at the moment in context over 13 years ago i tried to start a, a china legal practice and i failed at that and then i tried again with the, the benefit of a large international law firms platform and again it didn't work so uh, failed projects and startups are fantastic flying hours so if you are in the crypto space um, consider that a philosophy okay uh, next uh, slide please michael so this is what we'll cover i've only got 20 minutes and clearly i'm covering four different jurisdictions uh, as well as uh, other technical points so i'll try to go through it fairly quickly without 
being so quick that we, we can't um, try and absorb some of the more important points and also try and make it uh, memorable. Uh, next slide, please. So I think this is a way of memorably capturing what has happened over the last 12 years or so. If you think of fiat money as a, a territory and an army, it, it's a force, it's been established and stable for 200 years and everyone is happy thereabouts, certainly in, in the context of, of G20 OECD uh, currencies with its incumbency. First battle occurs post 2009 when Bitcoin starts to try and come into the, the Eastern territory of a medium of exchange. And we can see that by plenty of evidence in terms of both marketing and indeed the original uh, Satoshi and Nakamoto's white paper. And Bitcoin, if you recall, at one point, the marketing was all about it will be able to be used to buy any goods or service. But I remember in 2007, I was helping uh, Deutsche Bank understand uh, crypto. And what my initial research was that you could buy um, books from MIT's student bookshop and sandwiches from Subway. And, and clearly that's not going to be enough nourishment and it's certainly not a medium of exchange. There wasn't a, that across the board availability of goods and services using Bitcoin. From 2015, you have a second battle taking place, and that's the battle of stable coins, so-called stable coins, coming in to market themselves as an alternative to a fiat currency. And you can sense that there's some hypocrisy here because the philosophy behind a, a crypto asset is that the, the main structure is to consider that they don't want to be centralized, it's decentralized. So therefore relying on an asset that is absolutely central doesn't quite fit with that logic. But anyway, I suspect it's because they've lost the medium of exchange battle and they're thinking, well, if we can win confidence, uh, gain assets uh, as, as we fight and win over as a store of value, that may happen. Overall, we can say that those haven't been successful. And if uh, Michael, if you could um, go to the next slide, please. You can see it in this context. There's quite a lot of information on this uh, chart and I think other the others will be able to have a look at it later. I'm, I'm sure you'll be able to get access to it. But if you can just sit at the top um, right hand corner, it's showing Bitcoin's market capitalization is $340 billion. That is not a small sum. But of course, in the overall context of the global monetary system, it is, given that the overall monetary system is expressed in uh, the trillions. So that's the, the type of resources they've had, but it's not enough to start to to be able to offer yourself a, as a store of value. Other points to note on this slide, because there is a lot of information, but when I created it, I think the column that I found most memorable is the controlling minds, by which I mean, by normal standards, directors really matter, the captains in, in control of firms really matter. And of course, Bitcoin is leaderless. And when you have those sorts of situations, you don't have the governance and you don't have the transparency over um, what the direction of, of an asset. And in doing that, you don't have the, the confidence. It, turning to briefly another column that's obviously of interest, the consensus mechanisms have clearly changed. We started off, and it, this is in um, Satoshi's white paper, uh, they're relying on electricity and computer power. That's a proof of work model. But as we know, because it's so environmentally um, costly, there's a move over to proof of stake. But of course, proof of stake is going towards a sort of centralized control um, model. So again, that, that's sort of counter the philosophy of people in the, the crypto subsector to want to decentralize things. And it, of course, has um, various unfairness factors given that you can have a dom you can have dominant players having increasing um, opportunity to make more and more coins. Um, next slide, please, Michael. 
So turning to the collapse of Terra Luna in May 2022, Do Kwon is the main founder. There was also someone called Daniel Shin, but Do Kwon is a, a South Korean who studied at Stanford. He came back to South Korea and was able to form uh, Terraform Labs in 2018. His protocol worked on the basis of rather than pegging the stable coin uh, called Terra USD to f physical cash US dollar reserves uh, and be able to show an account to that effect, it was linked to an, an algorithmic um, stable coin, which of course is a contradiction in terms because no algorithm could be completely stable, but that's what in effect he did. And it was very successful up to May of this year. And, and how it worked was that the value of a Terra USD, which is the stable coin, you notice they're using a lot of the same words, so it can be confusing and I'll, I'll slow down here, but the value of Terra USD was determined by exchanging one Terra USD for one dollar's worth of its sister token, Terra Luna. So Terra Luna is in effect floating. Theoretically, arbitrage activity kept one Terra USD close to one US dollar, that's one fiat US dollar, with any volatility absorbed by adjusting the supply of Terra Luna. Well, this model all breaks down in May of this year, and we're over a five-day period, the, the Terra Luna went from $61 down to zero. In, over that same period, the uh, fixed um, element, the, the, uh, the, the Terra USD, which is of course meant to be pegged to the US dollar, that also wavered and, and dropped from 99 cents to 95. Uh, Overall, the consequence was 40 billion um, loss of US dollars and 280,000 Koreans affected. Maybe to put this in more memorable terms, um, my maths is that it, you consider the UK is a, a slightly larger population, about 10 million more. If that had happened in the UK, you'd have 350,000 customers affected by such a debacle, by such a collapse. So it's a significant amount of money. If you start extrapolating that up to the US, you're talking over a million. So th these, these are potentially very destabilizing, possibly even systemic events. Uh, next slide, please, Michael. And I think this is the, could be the, uh, the poll question. Over to you. Indeed, it is our poll. Um, and we're just going to launch that poll. So what, uh, given what uh, Ian has just spoken about, and remember Terry USD, as you know, is pegged uh, to the dollar uh, and it had a slip. Did it slip a little bit further? And if so, how far? Please select one and don't peek online. Great, well, as ever, Ian, uh, the FS Club audience uh, is, if nothing else, at least opinionated and know what they think. I think we're ready to close that vote with three quarters of the audience having voted. And well, nearly half the audience got the answer right, which, I, and I'll leave you to explain it, Ian, before we pull that away. Yes. So. Within um, a few months, but while um, Terra USD um, existed, it, confidence had gone. And of course, confidence is based on trust. So it, it's a really good example of once traders just don't have faith in something and they, they don't uh, perform as you would expect from your model, from your theory, your, your research paper, that's the sort of thing that can happen. Yeah, um, so anyway, right. down to uh, a penny yeah. or two. Yeah. yeah, so back to uh, the, the drier subject of regulation. As you've probably already seen in the quality press, the FCA come out of the um, F, um, FTX debacle really well because they've taken a cautious approach. Uh, they were asked from 2021 to basically act as a, a shield, a defensive mechanism for uh, crypto asset um, players coming into the UK in a hurry, trying to um, get regulated or indeed operate without being regulated. And the detail was quite significant. They were required to produce a business plan, show their IT systems outsourcing. And um, that, that, I suppose, is making them do what any mainstream um, applicant firm would do with the FCA. In addition to that, we can say there's a 
crypto is coming into the perimeter and perimeters sort of a regulator lawyers um speak uh, for the regulations apply to you and we can see that's immediately going to happen in 2023 with uh, changes to the financial services and markets act whereby crypto will be come part of um, legislation that's existed for 20 years so we can say that fca has got it right and it's with these two pieces of legislation they've achieved that the next slide please Right, next poll question. <clears throat> what percent, given what I've said, what percentage of asset firms applying for FCA registration have either had their application rejected or decided to withdraw it? Please select one. Well, folks, uh, as ever, uh... You're going to find folks very opinionated here as well. Uh, and this time, uh, I think we're ready to show the answers. Uh, the audience is even more right. 65% guessed 80%, and that is the correct answer. Is that not true, Ian? That's right. That's right. 80%. Um, some put, put, put it higher, but yes, it's of that order of magnitude. Um, so in turning to the EU, the EU's approach can be again it's what's coming in is mica the the markets in crypto assets regulation it's it's going to be the case that it has some similarities what, what we're doing in the uk but there are some differences the fining which i, I like to look at is archers firing arrows um, uh, from the top of the castle because obviously that's a it's a very different thing from trying to say are you entrepreneurial how can we help you but the thing that troubles me most is white paper. Now, white papers range from Robert Kahn's excellent um, paper on TCP uh, and, and the, the, um, the start of the in internet where uh, electronic engineers produce papers of, of great meaning and, and importance, seminal importance. So it's now they've become marketing documents. So I think this is a mistake uh, in my view, the EU um, asking uh, the firms to produce a white paper is the wrong approach. Uh, a better approach would be say, in your business plan, you've got to state what you're doing. And if you change what you're doing, we need version control. And, and anyone who's dealt with the FCA for, for some time with the senior managers regime will know that that will dovetail very nicely with how the senior managers regime works. So again, it's, it goes to governance and, and directors uh, and a, a more structured approach. Uh, MICA is expected to come in in 2000. And 24 because it has transitional rules so not for a while but it will change things significantly and you will need to be registered in the eu if you're dealing in the eu uh, next slide please so singapore's approach i like to look as as hadrian's wall in the sense that as we all know hadrian's wall isn't just a wall there are um entrances and exits to it so in many ways it it's not a, a castle wall it's a filter it's a way of seeing oh, who's coming in, who's um, coming out and so forth. Um, so I think their approach is clever in that they're clearly an entrepreneurial jurisdiction. They want to do more with the right types of um, crypto asset players, but they, they want to slow things down and have a better understanding. And evidence of that, of course, is clever guidelines that is stopping public advertising of crypto assets where, where the crypto asset firm is clearly targeting um, at the retail level, which is exactly where you'll have the most harm. Uh, next slide, please. US approach I see as a, a claymore. Now, a claymore is a really effective weapon, as we know. You can um, you can dispose, dispatch of many of your 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 enemies, but you don't have a shield, um, and you're, you're too much concentrating on being aggressive. And in my view, that's how really how the SEC has behaved. In their defense, though, one can say the counter argument is just look at that top line, coin seed, coin schedule, DeFi money market, crypto FX, uh, misleading organizations that have caused all sorts of problems and do affect consumers. So you would expect some litigation, but perhaps not as much as they have gone for. Uh, of course, the most significant one being Ripple, where they're basically saying it should be registered as an investment contract because it qualifies under the Howey test. Howey tests very established test for whether something is an investment contract that goes back to the 1940s. Next slide, please. And consequence of using this Claymore is not only uh, is it likely that, that 
the SEC will not be successful in um, stating that the, the Ripple um, asset is subject to an investment contract. You can see here that um, this uh, recent tweet is a tweet from August from the lead lawyer of a class action that they already have over 70,000 um, class action participants whereby um, individuals that have been holding XRP um, are aggrieved by the, the situation of their currency um, diminishing because of um, SEC's um, publicity uh, around Ripple. Uh, next slide, please. This is, I think, a way of looking at the strategy going forward for any regulator. So this is agnostic, it's not just the UK way. Uh, and the way I see this is that you have to think in terms of, is it a security token? Is it a utility token? And it, or is it an exchange token? And any conversation with an applicant firm should be on that basis. And then you would take a precautionary approach, um, by which I mean that, that that's borrowing from principally science, but not just science, uh, whereby you, you take a, a cautionary approach to allowing something to come into your regulatory environment and you reverse the burden of proof. So you basically say to the applicant firm, you need to have proof of concept or we need to put this in some simulation. Um, we're being entrepreneurial. We want you to succeed, but you need to show that it is a security token. It works in the ways based on our established um, uh, tokens, uh, on our established exchange tokens, on our established utility tokens. And that seems a fair way. And of course, some uh, crypto assets will be both. And that's fine, but it needs to be pinned down what they are. And the precautionary approach will, um, I think, achieve that. And next slide, please. This is the uh, final um, uh, poll question. Yes, so here we go. <laughs> so in your assessment, what level of risk is there in purchasing crypto assets? Low to medium, medium, high risk or a gamble? And uh, yet again, we have an audience. And actually, before we show the results there, what, what's your, how would you answer this, Ian? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's tricky. Yeah. I think I'd go for high risk, adventurous investment. Uh, I think you're playing it safe. I'd go for a gamble. Let's see what the audience thinks. There we go. So uh, nearly two thirds think it's a gamble. So, uh, anyway, 95% think it's a uh, it's there. And I would, would really welcome comments and questions from the 5% of the audience who said low. You know, this isn't a we're here to discuss with each other, and you clearly disagree with Ian and me. And I'd really like to have some comments or observations and happy to include those. Anyway, back to, back to you, Ian. Yep, so finally, this slide, I'm conscious of time, but this is quite important. It's what else can be done because we can't leave it all to the regulators. There's lots of experience in the city and elsewhere to contribute. And I would say from a, com from a, a common sense point of view, there has been a lot of misleading marketing around describing crypto assets as coins, uh, as describing them as stable coins or currency. And I think if that to be removed, that would make a lot of sense. G uh, publishing good and bad governance is the other point. And then finally, those familiar with MIFID, RTS, you know, RTS 6, of course, deals with um, algorithmic management where you have to make clear what your algorithm is, that you've got controls around it, that you're reviewing it, and that you have kill switches. And given events surrounding um, Luna, where that algorithm clearly went out of control quite quickly, having similar RTS type uh, you know, technical um, test standards also makes sense. That's it. Great. Well, thank you so much for a really uh, quick canter through an area. And also, may I say, for keeping to time, uh, we've got uh, nearly 40 people online. So, uh, folks, please do pip your questions in quickly. We've got quite a few there. Um, actually, I will exercise Chairman's prerogative. And just a quick one to you, Ian. Um, you know, in looking at this, I sometimes think uh, the regulators, and I'll, I'll pick here particularly on the SEC uh, and the FCA, have been too quick to think that this is something they should actually bother with. I would argue that they wouldn't care if I was issuing green stamps or something. And a lot of the tokens that I have some credibility with are those associated with the service. And it's basically like a, a, a frequent flyers or a customer loyalty card. So they don't play with those. There's another group on the other hand, which to me are just gambling chips. 
Now in the States, that's a bit of a problem, but over here in the UK, extremely simple. We have the Gambling Commission, which is a regulator. So if I want to make sure there's some good uh, AML uh, regulation in this sector, which I can see, well, uh, we do that already on gambling. Why does the FCA feel that it's a financial instrument or the SEC? And I might even argue, having given this advice to the FCA almost 10 years ago, um, they'd have been in a better spot if they just said it by actually saying we're going to regulate it uh, as an investment, which they dithered on for ages. They've given it false legitimacy. You know, oh, it must be an investment because the FCA is regulating it. Anyway, enough from me. What do you think? Well, that's, it's a great question. I think briefly, it, it shows a lack of having a multidisciplinary team understand something quickly. So I'm a financial regulation lawyer. I don't have all the answers. I know you have strong economics background. I have fairly good economics background. But I remember when I was in Deutsche Bank, how I quickly worked out, I think this is an adventurous investment in my view, is that the volatility, and this is a memorable point, if you think the volatility of um, Argentine pesos is the European Alps, uh, Bitcoin is the Himalayas. And when you see that level of volatility, that, that, that is getting close to a gamble. It's not something someone can rely on to save. It's, it's never going to be a store of value. So I agree. It, it, it's a, you, you needed to bring more experts into the room. Okay. Well, um, let, let's uh, dwell on this uh, conclusion that you have here. Uh, Peter Davy uh, says, you say ban stable coin. Why? Uh, to me, tr true stable coins seem something that might actually have utility. Because they're not stable. That's it. Good. Well, <laughs> so that one. Um, uh, Hugh Purser is, is curious. Uh, isn't there, you know, in old times, the collapse of an exchange would be considered more serious than that of a single investment asset. Uh, but the collapse of FTX seems to be swept up in the poor performance of cryptos and coins, etc. cetera, uh, as opposed to saying, here's an exchange that you know, collapsed. And we see this in terms of media reporting and even public perception is the crypto element, not the fact that an exchange imploded. Um, and uh, he, he's sort of pointing out as well that when a company goes bust, shareholders lose money, but often there may be assets for sale or even an ongoing concern that can be resurrected. Uh, but a crypto crash just leaves thin air. Is this a fair comparison? It's complex. Consider with FTX, I was just reading in the last 24 hours, I think it's in Science Journal, a number of recipients of important grants to AI, climate change, um, pandemic um, stability projects. It comes from the FTX Foundation. So it's as if crypto's already become quite mature and it will, it will affect lots of different actors, some of which are um, very central, such as you know, university research institutions. So I think it, it's, we, it will be complicated. It, it can't just be seen as, as, as isolated and different from um, you know, other crashes before. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Clive Bullen, um, he, he, he believes that all currencies uh, might be purely backed by governments to mitigate risk. And, and I think he's sort of violently agreeing with you, but you might rip, riff off this. Isn't there too much risk in these currencies, given the reliance on organizations that are difficult to trust and the poor history of the currencies? It, it's mixed because there are examples, um, which is a good example. Um, so USD coin, that is, uh, it, it's, a governance is quite strong. Uh, it, uh, it tests its um, reserves, so it, it, because it's a mixed picture, you do have, uh, and in, maybe increasingly so, given the regulators will be very interested in all crypto activity going forward. So you, you do have some examples of um, crypto organisations that have a board, uh, that have a headquarters, and in effect they're evolving, they're moving towards the perimeter, if you like, the, the mainstream. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's an excellent point here from Peter Davey. Um, a true stable coin will be 100% collateralized, which is, I think, the issue. I'll come back to that if I may in a moment. Akin to, um, you know, the payment services directive two or electronic money institutions, EMI. Um, 
I mean, to me, this has been one of the problems when I came into the city in the very early 80s, one of the great talks was about gold certificates. And uh, you immediately had uh, the one thing is the paper and the certificate, and could it be fraudulent? But, you know, at the end of the day, it, you know, that type of technology is okay. We've got anti-counterfeiting. There'll be some problems, but we, we kind of knew where it was. The real problem was where's the gold? <laughs> and how do I know the gold's there? Is it being kept? If it's being kept, who's guarding it? What's the insurance on that, uh, et cetera? And that costs real money. So there's a cost to keeping things. Um, and one of the things that bothered me uh, about Tether and all these is who is paying for it? You know, where, where, where is it? Where, where is this money? As we've seen with Tether, they're very uh, flaky about where, where, where they claim it is. So that's your first problem. Uh, and we've seen that uh, in, in a number of these other exchanges. But that keeping of that money has a cost, which doesn't seem to be factored into these. So these are kind of magic money trees as well, aren't they? That's right. And also the irony is what you're saying, Michael, is you'd have more confidence in it if it were implying that if you had a third party that can verify there is this reserve. Well, that is that's the system we've got now. And you, it is as if many of the white papers, you can see there's this idealism of you don't need central bodies, but you, ha you have central bodies and third parties because they provide the layer of trust. Um, so yeah. I, I think that that is what solves, um, what helps something to be stable is a third party verifying the reserves. Uh, well, we're in violent agreement to me and uh, it goes back to the central third party problem. What's, what everybody's been trying to solve is a central third party problem. They put in a solution that looks decentralized but there are bits of the solution that are problematic. And the answer is to introduce central third parties. And so you just go in this infinite loop of trying to get rid of something uh, that is, there. it feels a wee bit, you know, from a physics point of view, uh, like the ether in the 19th century before Einstein said, well, what if there was no ether? Uh, yes. Yeah, so good. Um, great. Uh, Peter Davy again, uh, and I, I appreciate your comments, Peter. The advantage of true regulated stable coins uh, or CBDCs could be programmability for atomic or uh, DVP, PVP settlement. So, um, and I can see that, but I think this raises an opportunity. If I had a stable coin and I had a CBDC, would I need the stable coin? Yeah. Well, I I've, I think it's again. It's, a, it's an example when you start hearing um, CBDCs mentioned, you think, well, this is you, you're moving the project, the white paper projects of decentralization, to saying that you think there is scope to to provide something that is a substitute um, for a, a fiat currency. So from that point of view, I, I, don't, I almost feel it doesn't fit in. It, it's, it's very separate. And it, as you've pointed out elsewhere, it, it's um, completely removed from uh, DLT, blockchain technology. It, it's, a, it's just a completely different project, it's a different issue. Yeah. Well, Mark Darby is trying to help us here. He, he says, is Hans Christian Andersen's uh, The King's New Clothes or The Emperor's New Clothes a correct analysis of cryptocurrency's value? Uh, but uh, we'll leave that to one side, but it's a, it's a, it's a cute observation, Mark, and may help us. Now, um, Shan Turnbull is, is frequently on here, and uh, Shan, you know, you are a one-question kind of guy, um, but today I'm taking your question because it's very pertinent. Uh, we've been speaking about the relationship between stable coins and currencies, but there have been numerous proposals, Ian, for uh, coins based on other things, and I've seen proposals for carbon, uh, energy. We have a long running, in fact, Emergy project, which dates back to the 50s, uh, where I, I think it was uh, Otram was trying to create a currency based around energy consumption in, uh, in, eco, uh, in ecosystems. So to Shan's question, it's a bit lengthy, so listen hard here. Would the best strategy for regulators to deal with crypto or other private currencies be for governments creating not a store of value money, but an objectively determined stable tether for competing decentralized banking, creating a medium of exchange when and where needed. Crypto money is like official money, uh, and but that's created the market failure that according to COP27 is leading us on a highway to climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator. 
we need a monetary tether that can sustain the well-being of people and planet. So an existing simple objective stable tether could be the percentage of sustainable energy consumed in an economy as a percentage of total energy consumed. So we're seeing this uh, approach to trying somehow to make the, the, the tethering to something that is non-monetary. How do you feel about those sorts of projects, Ian? Well, I cover ESG, so it's something I think about all the time. And my, my thought is that it's as if the, the blockchain can be used for something other than tethering a, a form of uh, asset value. And a great example I saw was at the leading artificial intelligence conference this summer. There were people from, I forget, it could have been Shell, but it was equivalent. It was a, a, a big uh, multinational corporation. They were cleverly um, putting forward that you would use a blockchain to cover um, an energy use uh, throughout a supply chain. So I can see the use for a blockchain to act as an auditor to show absolute transparency of who is green and who is not. But I, I still don't see it, the, the blockchain in terms of how it can help um, stability for, of currencies. Okay. Now, um, in terms of your current work in this space, what, what are you doing? Well, we have fintech clients um, globally, um, and people will know that um, Grant Thornton has um, crypto asset clients. They've helped um, some of the ones I was mentioning earlier that are evolving and um, being as corporate as they can, as quickly as they can. They've had their reserves attested. So that that might be an example of where if you, ha you have a stable coin, um, what you would need to do is continuously have a third party verify that you have the, the reserves you say you have. So I would say we are not um, doing a great deal yet, but I suspect um, in the long term as a, a high net worth asset, um, crypto will be around. So it will be something that um, more mainstream uh, regulated firms will consider absolutely we, we, i know that from uh, watching how they they plan and if you can see blackrock were interested in ftx so um anything's possible right um, i'm going to put a quick request out uh, shan if you've got any links you wanted to share with the audience on your stable coin i've got requests here to do it um uh, there's another question though from shan uh, if you personally would like to have a reference link to the shell blockchain energy suggestion uh, shan is asking you ian does the work done by Grant Thornton create a conflict of interest in the decisions that you're making? I think what Shen's referring to is your advising clients, and, and this slide is not saying they're wrong, but it's a pretty strong message that uh, you need to be careful. So, yes, to be clear, um, in the UK, we do not advise a crypto asset firms at the moment not in my division but my okay. point was more actually you no know, it's a global uh, firm in new york um one of the and again the the um the publicities out there the attestation has been well respected at least that's moving towards the sort of things you'd want to do you know it's a it's not the equivalent of an audit but yes grant thornton um has been involved in the us with crypto asset businesses Excellent. No, and, and and just a reminder that uh, Ian did open by saying that he's making his remarks in a private capacity, but yeah. I yeah. appreciate the clarification for, for the audience. Now, I'd just like to turn to two last questions, if I may. Uh, one inspired uh, by Hugh Purser, who's been wondering about uh, media reporting and public perception of the sector. Is the media helping or you know, do they even understand what they're reporting on? So this is a great question because if you go back to and anyone can check this uh, Isabella Kaminsky was the, uh, the fintech person a few years ago and she's made some profound comments about DLT for example saying it's not always a good idea to have a permanent record of something consider a teenager's um, it, they might say something when they're 17 and then regret it when they're 25. But if it's permanently on the blockchain, that's that's not constructive. So it, it's not a panacea. And then secondly, Jemima Kelly, more recently, she has consistently been the devil's advocate, saying, uh, I don't get it. Um, 
it's not profitable. The people don't have the experience that they, there's no transparency when you ask them difficult economic questions. So she, she's produced some brilliant pieces of paper worthy of uh, lawyers, actually, because they're often evidence based where she's saying, well, here's the spreadsheet. This, is, this isn't uh, the sort of spreadsheet you'd expect to see. So um, it absolutely, certainly the FT, I think, has been excellent. Hmm. Great. Now, um, one last one. I mean, uh, we can tether to a number of things. And obviously, uh, the sector has given a tremendous amount of thought uh, to some of the difficulties. And so therefore, um, what do you think of tethering to an NFT? Well, <laughs> it, it might be that given they're not doing any harm, let's say, so do you mean, for example, if it was a piece of art? Yeah. Okay, so let's say we had a non-fungible token. It was a piece of art. It was, say, something equivalent to Banksy. It, it's not doing any harm. But it, again, it, it, you, you can be too prejudicial, can't you? I might think, because I'm a, a white older male um, from the UK, that um, a whiskey club or a fine wine or uh, having a sports car is a good investment. Now, those are all stable and they do have a store of value. So I have to add that in. But I can see... It's being open-minded. If, if people want to spend their money in that way, and it's uh, protected by a third party, uh, the you know, coppers of the, this world, the copper firm and, and equivalents are going to do well because people do have digital um, assets that they will want to store. Why not? That that could that could easily be something that surprises everyone as a as as an emerging asset. Okay. And I guess as we uh, sort, of, sort of briefly come to the end, uh, in the previous question, we touched on something that I think is interesting, which is that in the CBDC world, the debate we're still yet to have is about the anonymity, that, that destruction of uh, knowledge over time that uh, uh, Kaminsky and Kelly were uh, concerned about. Um, actually, we've got just one quick question, uh, again from Hugh. Is there any early evidence of precedent emerging from court cases dealing with crypto caches and liability claims, or is it just too early that we're just seeing the cases? We're just seeing the cases, um, but it's really worth watching um, the High Court, the English High Court at the moment, because the, there are important decisions that may be made over the, um, the qualification of um, a crypto asset as property. We all know from the task force, um, uh, Jeffrey Voss's group of people, that, that, that there's been a lot of analysis put into that, and it's been uh, it's been persuasive as a document that's been referred to in, in New Zealand and Canada. But that's you know having a, a high court decision on top of that um, could be quite significant. So yes, watch this space in the English high courts. Okay, great. Well, um, if I may, I'm going to have to hold us to time. Uh, firstly, I would very, very much like to thank you, uh, Ian. But uh, before I do so, I would uh, like to go and thank the audience. Uh, firstly, you've been great today. As I mentioned, all of your comments and questions with your emails attached will be sent on to Ian. And a number of you have asked uh, for connections with each other, and I'll, I'll, I'll do that immediately afterwards. Uh, secondly, our sponsors here before you. They are a very tolerant crowd, uh, and I hope that uh, but there are some interesting things in the crypto world. I think we are learning some things. Some of them are old truisms about exchanges and do good, good to be true in fear of missing out. Uh, some of them are uh, new ways of looking at technology and coming up against the old chestnuts. But I do think ultimately in the, uh, in the wake of many of these experiments that fail, there are still bits to be learned. And so while I may be skeptical about the crypto area, uh, as it is. It's a wonderful breeding ground for ideas and technology that I hope in the future will be reassembled, uh, you know, as Schumpeter goes on about creative destruction. And part of creative destruction is recycling as you learn, and you don't learn without some, without breaking things. So uh, I think this is a useful thing. And Ian, it's great to have you watching over it. So again, our thanks to you uh, for putting forward a very uh, brief and compelling presentation, reminding us of some of the eternal verities and uh, to the audience and to Ian, uh, looking forward to seeing you again. We'll be having more crypto stuff in the new year, um, but our big event uh, next week is going to be the launch of Smart Centers Index 6. Uh, absolutely uh, an exciting event for us. Uh, and then we'll be a look, I think that's actually a Tuesday and not on a Thursday, 
Um, and then we'll be looking at software risks. Uh, government corporate finance, we're actually going to have uh, the NAO speaking with us there. Uh, I think it's going to be fascinating to look at how they view uh, finance from a government perspective, which isn't quite uh, the way a corporate would. And then finally, financial centers of the world, we're going to go and have a look at Estonia. So lots coming up. But Ian, if I may, I'll thank you on behalf of the audience. And I'm sorry for the pathetic clapping. And we hope to have you back because it's nice to have an observer, a critical observer in a sector great. that everybody's keeping an eye on. Okay, great. And finally, can I just point out a, a, a shameless plug? Uh, there are people such as Chris Glennie, ex-Bank of England, um, and also uh, a couple of um, King's Council on. We're producing a crypto asset book um, published by Sweet oh. Maxwell in the new year. So there will be a book that covers a number of crypto asset issues coming out in 2023.